Mon nom est Luc bougnol Lafont. je dirige le service culturel et l'auditorium du musée d'Orsay. Et j'ai à mes côtés les trois commissaires de l'exposition Splendeur et misère, image de la prostitution, euh, Marie Robert, qui est conservateur euh, photographie au musée d'Orsay, Isole Pludermacher, euh, qui est conservateur euh, peinture au musée d'Orsay et euh, Richard Thompson qui est professeur d'histoire de l'art à l'université d'Édimbourg et qui est égal et Nickabaka qui n'est pas avec nous aujourd'hui qui nous rejoindra demain donc qui sont les quatre commissaires euh, de cette exposition qui euh, vous le savez peut-être mais qui connaît un succès absolument spectaculaire inat euh, presque inattendu puisque nous avons 5000 visiteurs par jour qui viennent le voir ça montre euh, d'abord la qualité de cette, de cette, de cette exposition la grand, euh, très grande qualité de cette exposition et l'intérêt que euh, le public lui porte et porte à ce sujet euh, qui est un sujet qui est euh, pour la première fois traité sous la forme euh, d'une exposition nous avons estimé qu'il était très important d'organiser une journée de, de recherche, d'échange, euh, de, de colloque. Euh, et nous avons souhaité euh, inviter euh, à cette occasion, pour ouvrir euh, ce, ce, ce colloque, euh, Hollis Clayson, vraiment, qui, vient, qui est arrivé hier euh, des états unis qui a été, euh, euh, je crois, la première à écrire un ouvrage qui est devenu un ouvrage de référence en 1991, euh, Painted Love, euh, qui a été euh, le premier ouvrage euh, écrit sur l'influence, sur le thème de la prostitution dans l'art impressionniste en France. Et euh, un livre qu'on peut, qui malheureusement, j'en discutais avec euh, Hollis tout à l'heure, qui est euh, out of print, comme on dit en français, qui, ne, qui est euh, épuisé, merci, euh, qui est épuisé, mais qu'on trouve toujours euh, sur, les, euh, sur le site du Getty Museum. Donc on peut aller lire, consulter euh, son livre, qui, et je trouve ça vraiment dommage, je lui dis si jamais il y avait des éditeurs dans la salle, qui n'a jamais été traduit, euh, jamais traduit en français. Voilà. Euh, je voudrais peut-être demander à, à Isolde Plutermacher de vous dire quelques mots sur le, le déroulement et le contenu euh, de ces deux, de, deux journées qui promettent d'être passionnantes. Merci Luc. Bonjour à tous. Euh, Marie Robert, Richard Thompson et moi-même sommes très heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui à ce colloque intitulé « Images et imaginaires de la prostitution au XIXe siècle », rassemblant 17 intervenants et intervenantes, professeurs, conservateurs et jeunes chercheurs, français et américains. Colloque qui se tiendra sur deux journées. Ce colloque nous est apparu comme le prolongement et le complément naturel de l'exposition dans laquelle nous avons rassemblé un grand nombre d'œuvres et de documents autour de six grandes sections, de manière à montrer à quel point la prostitution est un sujet incontournable dans la société, la littérature et les arts du XIXe siècle. Je souhaite également à ce propos vous signaler la publication d'une revue également qui a rassemblé plusieurs spécialistes de différentes disciplines sur le sujet et l'abécédaire de la prostitution. La revue sera d'ailleurs présentée au colloque, pardon, à l'auditorium début décembre. Euh... Ce sujet donc, de la prostitution a fait et fait encore l'objet de nombreuses recherches dont l'exposition se veut pour partie le reflet et nous sommes très honorés d'avoir pu rassembler des spécialistes ayant mené des études fondamentales sur la question. Le colloque comprend trois, ses trois sessions organisées autour de trois thématiques. Cet après-midi sera abordée la maison close avec des questions tournant autour de l'architecture et des décors, des fantasmes qu'ils génèrent et notamment des fantasmes orientalistes. Demain matin, nous parlerons des mondes interlopes, des images variées de la prostitution en dehors des maisons closes, rues, théâtres, music hall, cafés, restaurants, hôtels particuliers. Et demain après-midi, dans une session intitulée « Corps capitaux », nous parlerons de l'imaginaire qui nourrit les représentations de la prostitution, des fantasmes à l'épreuve de la réalité sociale, à travers notamment les bordels fantasmés des monotypes noirs de Degas, la photographie obscène employée par Zola dans Nana, les moulages et cires anatomiques de syphilitique et les représentations de la, de la République en prostituée dans l'illustration de presse au tournant du siècle. 
Si l'histoire de l'art sera à l'honneur dans ses interventions, l'histoire sociale, l'histoire des femmes et du genre, l'histoire littéraire apporteront également une contribution enrichissante à la connaissance du phénomène. La prostitution est en effet un sujet qui intéresse toutes les disciplines au sein des sciences humaines et nous sommes très heureux d'avoir pu rassembler autour de cet objet partagé des historiens, historiens de l'art et sociologues. Et j'ai maintenant l'immense plaisir d'accueillir Holly Clayson, que Luc vous a présenté, auteur de l'incontournable Painted Love, et qui nous propose aujourd'hui de revisiter son travail. Et nous attendons avec impatience ces nouvelles propositions. Bonjour tous, bonjour toutes. Je suis très contente d'être ici et vous êtes très, très gentil de me permettre de euh, parler en anglais. <rire> So, look, this is a lecture of a very particular, even completely eccentric sort. At least it's completely unlike anything I've given before. After all, I stopped working on the visual representation of prostitution in the later 19th century when I published um, that book in, uh, seems like only yesterday, uh, in 1991. Am I then today going to conduct a kind of highly self-conscious and utterly unrelievedly self-referential one-person referendum on the validity of my own 24-year-old conclusions? Or shall I, on the occasion of this landmark Orsay exhibition, which unfortunately I still haven't seen, so I am, for, at least for now, maintaining a certain kind of innocence, um, Or shall I launch a new account based upon nothing but a crude methodological savvy combined with morsels of research from other projects? Well, you'll see as this unfolds that it blends confirmation with disavowal, that it weaves a repetition of old ideas with a few new insights. So one of the main arguments I made in that book was an unapologetically feminist one. I project here what I thought was a, a sentence that more or less uh, laid out a central proposition. As you see, the art I'm analyzing here records the ideological use of certain women through their transformation into the topoi of a culture, the subject matter of ambitious mostly male art. So I want to think hard about the general thrust of that argument and its validity today. And I want to focus and encourage all of you also to think hard about this proposition um, regarding ideological use. Surely one thing is certain, I hope you'll all agree with me, 24 years ago, it was important to observe that the Paris-based modernist project of the 1870s and 1880s was a gendered one. Surely today, that's something that can, well, that va sans dire. Let me say a few more things about my book's main points while you look at one of Cezanne's most arresting, even dumbfounding watercolors uh, entitled uh, Olympia, done in 1877. So a key aspect of that book, Painted Love, was its focus right upon modernist paintings and my interest in demonstrating those paintings um, move against the narratable and thus their general absence of a storyline in the sense, right, of a clear plot, let alone any moralizing content or subtext. Indeed, a veering away from moralizing narrative is one of the qualities I insisted defined those pictures. The book certainly adduced plenty, lots and lots of visual images from other registers of contemporary visual culture. And you'll see I have more to say on what strikes me now as a cavalier treatment of caricature in, in due course today. But in that book, my main object was modernist art, especially the work of Cézanne, uh, Degas, and Manet. Well, especially Degas and Manet. 
Well, especially Manet. <laughs> so the main overarching paradox that I um, eagerly uh, sought to demonstrate was that the legible subject par excellence, prostitution, the exchange of money for sex, was treated ambiguously in some of the most ambitious paintings of the later 1870s and earlier 1880s. As my friend, the eminent American art historian Tom Crow said recently, all great art is built on paradox. I hadn't previously thought that myself as such, but that does seem right, and my remarks today will put that particular proposition to the test. The years, so the years I studied in that, that book of mine were those of a massive increase in the covert venal sex economy. In those conditions, I argued that a correlation could be drawn between the instability of the prostitute's identity, especially the identity of the clandestine prostitute, and the ambiguity of uh, the modernist painted representation. Another correlation made in that study was that the avant-garde's gravitation to the subject matter of urban prostitution should not have been seen surprising because, indeed, it should, be, should have been understood as sort of multiply or overdetermined. Why? Ah, because the clandestine prostitute combined instability with the commodity and was thus a topic and a social actor at the very center, indeed tailor-made to go along with a leading concept or ideology of modernity. In the face of such explicitly sexualized themes, the thing I argued you could see was that in those paintings that interested me, the privileged rhetorics of representation were Here's, the, here's the, 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 ad, the adverb of the day, paradoxically, ellipsis and reserve. Now, the tense scenario in Cezanne's watercolor appears to thematize, even allegorize, the conundrum faced by the ambitious period modernist oriented to the practices of modern life when trying to understand and visualize the contemporary prostitute, or rather, as I wrote previously, it could be read to register an awareness of the impossibility of finding pleasure in the sexual marketplace. And thus it's shot through, I think, with doubts about the erotics of prostitution. The picture is certainly, let's all agree to this, a scene of puzzlement. Of, uh, of inconclusive bodily display and inspection. What seems to cause that puzzlement? The frozen woman is not performing erotically. The two onlookers arranged in a gendered hierarchy might be seen as stand-ins for the modernist artist. Having seized upon the contemporary prostitute as the, you might say, ne plus ultra, of urban modernity, uh, but not knowing uh, what meanings with which to endow her, uh, her body, her actions, or her non-actions. How to figure an erotic subject with aesthetic froideur. Or in the words I used a long time ago, uh, Cezanne's Olympia pictures, this is one of a small cluster, as a lot of you know, Cezanne's Olympia pictures introduced the ways in which the painters of the Parisian avant-garde devised the means to attain an appearance of truthful representation of and detachment from the charged subject of contemporary prostitution while simultaneously perfecting a strategy of ideological containment of the erotic force of the woman portrayed. This argument of mine that aligned detachment with containment was a cheeky one and is worth revisitation. Certainly it stands, but it stands also in need of refinement, maybe not repudiation, 
but I think it needs updating and nuancing. The corpus of works exemplified by this monotype by uh, Edgar Degas, this group of uh, works commonly known um, to us as the brothel monotypes. This corpus has been analyzed extensively and well by many scholars, including Carol Armstrong, um, who's here someplace, uh, among others. Um, my, take, uh, my take insisted upon Degas having devised a language of the venal, naked uh, female body that messily erased the subjective interiority of the brothel worker and gave over these female actors to the world of exchange, a kind of ultimate right commodification of the fleshly individual woman. As such, I, I position these monotypes as perfect realizations of Walter Benjamin's point made in the 1930s, Walter Benjamin, the influential German literary critic who uh, worked in and wrote influentially about Paris, Walter Benjamin's point about the prostitute as the supreme example, right, of the commodity and the processes of commodification under capitalism because she was the seller and the sold combined. I noted, however, I noted, however, that many of the sheets did something very particular that might nuance that proposition. Namely, um, as you see here, there's obviously, I, obviously, that's what I say, there's, um, I think, clearly a restoration of the erotic appeal of the buttocks the eroticization of the prostitutional derriere. If only I'd named my book something like that. Anyway, um, I think um, it was, he found it irresistible, and I think it's undeniably in play in a number uh, of these sheets. So it's a bit of a contradiction, um, one that upholds, I think, the textuality of the body in the process. So what do we get as a result? Um, we end up with something um, rather complex. We end up with a sort of a composite or a split body, um, a kind of paradoxical sex worker who's simultaneously debased and sexy, but then on the other hand, maybe the combination of debasement and sexiness is uh, absolutely the paradox that fits perfectly. Anyway, um, let's look at a couple more of these extraordinary uh, brothel monotypes. In, in a couple cases, I'm looking at uh, etching aquatint restrikes of monotypes, but we won't worry about that for today. Um, here they are. I, something I hadn't noted previously was the degree to which Degas used visual puns often in these monotypes. Um, he frequently rhymed the heads of debased women with the globes of gas light fixtures. You can see him doing that repeatedly here, and he does it in other of his um, uh, prints as well. It's witty, it's plenty witty, but it's also in many ways cruel. But maybe I'm avoiding what we all actually see first here. The machinic glass globes rhyme also with exposed breasts. Do I need to point this out? Maybe I should. Uh, globes, breasts. You, you follow my thinking here. Um, the machinic glass globes, okay, also rhyme with exposed breasts. All the orbs, then, understood to be equivalently commercial, vulgar, and glaring or in the, rec in the impossibly, remarkably complicated uh, monotype at upper right, the glass globes float free of fixtures or wall, wall sconces, appearing instead as abstract spheres of illumination in the direction of which the upside down sock wearing prostitute at left appears, um, uh, appears to aim with her legs akimbo she looks motivated by and drawn to the orbs of light. A kind of, a kind of analogy is built 
between the apparatuses of artificial light and the maneuvers of disenchanted sex, or something like that. This also, um, if we had three or four hours together, I'm willing to modify the schedule if you are. Oh no, maybe not. Um, but um, I would take us down the road of uh, Degas' um, in, uh, uh, key role in what I call illumination discourse in these years. Um, a great adept of éclairage, someone who was very knowledgeable about the changing economy and um, visualities of lights in the city at the time um, would help us to see um, this maneuver um, within the framework of a larger pattern of interest. Two more of these monotypes. We can see here the, the filiation that Degas builds between the material culture of lamps and female bodies for sale is actually a light motif, no pun intended, um, of the series. Analogies and homologies must be added to our understanding of his rhetorical arsenal. Does it change what we might call the sexual politics of the prince? The answer to that question depends on what you think of the assimilation of women prostitutes into the world of machinic things, the world of apparatuses whose illuminations can be turned on and off. The rhyming is massively clever, but of course, it's also dehumanizing. But the accomplishment of a language of dehumanization succeeds in recognizing the psychic predations of sex work. That could be construed, in fact, as a feminist intervention. Or to return to my earlier proposition, maybe it could be described, we have to still think this over, as a strategy of containment of female erotic force. Let's move on to another um, uh, trope um, of uh, another uh, familiar trope in, in this the sort of the sphere of the iconography of um, contemporary prostitution, namely that of the cafe woman. I have three kinds of pictures combined here. Um, Degas, pastel over monotype, at left, uh, 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 Manet's La Prune um, from the mid-70s at right, and a caricature by Paul Hadol, um, his uh, Café Spider. No, so here we have assembled three approaches to one of the ubiquitous tropes of the era, the Café woman, as sexually available, indeed sexually deviant, or at least perennially available and sexually solicitous. Unambiguous headline news in period caricature, as um, is the case in Hadol's uh, extremely clever caricature. Um, that it, it bears an English caption is just an artifact of contemporary web culture. It did not bear an English caption when it appeared. Um, and the, the caricature is, is combined with two versions of um, modernist semantic open-endedness in the work of Degas and Manet. What I wrote um, about Manet's painting was this, quote, the image is vintage Manet. It includes all the ingredients of the usual social coding for the indecent cafe woman, but here the codes are muffled and brought to a stalemate, though certainly not refused. The painting does not escape agreement with the dominant ideology of the immoral, solitary woman in a cafe, but neither does it actively contribute to the reinforcement and dissemination of these ideas. If we just focus in on Degas and uh, Manet, um, we notice that in, uh, in the Degas, many small details, um, it, it works, th th there's a contrast in the way these things operate. I just want to point out the way in which certain small details in the Degas nail down the scurrilousness of the sitter's identity. And um, those gloves, that makeup, that facial expression, playing solitaire, they all add up to an, uh, sort of an unambiguous, uh, uh, sort of uh, nailing down of her identity as um, a, a, a sexually venal, problematic uh, presence alone in a cafe. So I'm saying that um, comparing these two, the Degas functions in a slightly different register of connotation and depiction. What if we, what if we um, put these together? 
What if we put Hot Dolls Cafe Spider together with that Degas? I think it's um, time to ask some questions about the big separation I had used to make between um, modernist art and caricature. Um, is, is the certitude and explicitness of this caricature really the opposite, really the other to Degas' pastel enhanced monotype? I'm not so sure. And my thinking about caricature has been um, deeply shaped recently by the work of literary scholar Mike Good, who defines caricature as an irretrievably conservative mode whose purpose is taxonomization and the recycling of types. Yes, that's what, uh, what Hado's Cafe Spider could be convincingly said to do, but I'm not so sure that Degas' um, print is not also somewhat invested in the same operation. I think, I think it's fair to see Manet's uh, painting exemplifying uh, a different approach that strikes me as pretty distinct from, pretty uh, distant from um, the operations of caricature that I was just um, uh, describing. So I want to explore more the resonance I just underscored um, between Degas' work and contemporaneous caricature. So let me say a few more things about the genre and the practice of caricature before we go back to Degas. This is a way of saying, this is a, a, this is, this is a moment of confession. Um, this is a way of saying that I used caricatures as foils in that um, 1990 book of mine, and I didn't bother to take them very seriously. They didn't need to be analyzed. They somehow were, were just kind of put on the page as if they just spoke for themselves. They were always, right, just positioned as the simple other to modernist complexity. To demonstrate um, a little bit more about how my perspective on caricature has changed, let me show you just two things. Um, here's an extraordinarily interesting work by Cham um, that is set right during the, um, the siege of Paris during the Franco-Prussian War. Um, caricaturists, this demonstrates that even in wartime, caricaturists were poised to give form to the perennial masculinist belief in the bottomless capacity of Parisienne to engage in sexual display even when it required carrying domestic lighting equipment out into the streets. And um, overall, thinking back, overall thinking back, I think I underestimated the degree to which caricature shared ideological territory and even sort of representational rhetorics with the modernist paintings and prints I so admired. My take on this <laughs> extraordinary and indeed hilarious 1880 graphic work by the incomparable Albert Robida takes root in a point that Alain Corbin made usefully years ago, quote, fear of the clandestine prostitute and concern about the sexual recklessness of decent women were two sides of the same coin, end quote. One of the core beliefs regarding the threat of female sexuality also informs this lampoon of the American Thomas Edison and his mastery of electricity. Uh, women were blamed for uh, creating, this is a quote from me, I think. Women were blamed for creating an increased male desire for their sexual services by brandishing their own sexual cupidity in the streets. And here comes a confirming quote from none other than Emile Zola, um, published early in 1881, i.e. very close to um, uh, the, the picture on the screen here. He wrote, among the bourgeoisie, a young girl is kept pure until her marriage. Only after the marriage does the effect of her spoiled surroundings and poor education throw her into the arms of a lover. It is not prostitution, it is adultery. The difference is only in the words, for one must really insist, adultery is the plague of the bourgeoisie, just as prostitution is the plague of the people." End quote. Now, of course, that, that proposition deserves a gloss, but I'm just going to use it to sort of um, turn it into a gloss or point of departure for this exceptional program by Robida. The specialization of this periodical, La Cargature, started up in 1880. 
under his direction was La Caricature des Mœurs, an intentionally less political program than that followed by the 1830s publication of the same name, edited, as many of you know, by Philippon. The front page of the uh, 19 June 1880 issue, an amalgamation of picture and text by uh, Robida himself, showcased the journal's prowess in the realm of social caricature. Nouvelle et merveilleuse invention d'Edison, a tour de force of the humorous imagination rooted in actuality, starred the angular and wildly charged up Thomas Edison in his laboratory. June 1880 was well into the flowering of the American inventor's transatlantic uh, reputation as the Wizard of Menlo Park, a term used famously by Vivier de Lille Adam in his uh, novel L'Ève Futur, begun in 1878. This is something um, that I'm sure you all know. Uh, everyone knows the date of the first successful test of the incandescent bulb in uh, Menlo Park, New Jersey. It's an anniversary I know that we all celebrate. It was, of course, done in December of 1879. And uh, there's a, a, a person in this room who knows more about the history of lighting than anyone else on Earth. I hope he agrees with me. Anyway, it secured, of course, Edison's reputation as electric light's flashiest prodigy, dispelling most of the doubts that had governed the thinking about him in the French electricien crowd. In Robida's front page scenario, a fiercely determined Edison has invented a preternaturally clever contraption that harnessed the omnipotent force par excellence, electricity, in order to satisfy the perpetual husbandly need to track and control the romantic meanderings of unsupervised wives. The device, brilliantly named, was the Fidelimetre, designed à indiquer le degré de fidélité des dames. By tracing the ups and downs of perpetually erratic young women, the temperamental twins, albeit married, of Verdi's La Donne Mobile, <laughs> a woman would sport the, jack, the gadget as if it were a flattened pocket watch or uh, pinned like a brooch or dangling from a fob. The dial registers her actions and intentions between two extremes Parfait et désastre. The women tricksters modeling the device in this case are, of course, both Americans, feral modern women par excellence. It should not come as a surprise that a joke defining Edison as the ne plus ultra of technological wizardry derides American mores at the same time as my, as my touchstone scholar Mike Good uh, maintains, in many cases, the primary purpose of an image and caricature seems to have been to specify or recycle a particular character type or set of types." End quote. Admiration for Edison's gadgets had moreover to be undercut by the deadly serious and frequently fierce transatlantic economic and cultural struggle over the ownership of electricity. The gag is leavened by another trope of Parisian boulevard humor. American women are cheeky and insolent compared to les Françaises, but um, structurally prone to adulterous adventure, um, uh, a, a sort of a standard um, sort of fixture of belief that I've already um, talked about as being an anchor of uh, the representation of uh, prostitution in Paris. At right is the urbanite uh, uh, with A, I'm, uh, I was uh, delighted to discover, if you look carefully uh, on, her, on her trunk here, there's a sticker that says Chicago. Uh, a train belching steam is close by under the heading Voyage. She is dressed sharply to roam freely. Here's a quick translation of the text there. The young American travels a lot. While her husband sits at his counter or in political assemblies, she runs around the world in complete freedom. 
but the fidelimetra is a witness and a guarantee. Every week, a photograph of the fidelimetra is sent to her husband, and if there is the least deviation, he sends by telegraph or telephone the order to return home. Rentrer at home. The other American bounding into the surf in bathing costume with long hair loosely streaming demonstrates the benefits of the device at the seashore under the heading Utilité, Ben de Mer. Uncle Sam is cunning. Everyone knows that. As soon as the Fidelimetre was available, all the spouses in the United States were provided with them. Beside what object has a more incontestable usefulness at the opening of the dangerous season at the seashore, which runs so many risks for the husbands stuck in the city by their business affairs, the Fidelimetre was adopted with enthusiasm by all the spouses in the American fashion. Oh, so the, the, the social and technological modernity of the contraption was thus all-inclusive. Nothing less could be expected from the capacious mind of Robida, an artist whose ability to imagine the future ingeniously, as many of you know, was unparalleled. The fidelity meter was an impeccable specimen of the American inventor's outsized talent seen through the lens of Robida's singular comic dexterity, inasmuch as Edison's mechanical brainchild commingled the resources of an electric sensor, photography, telegraphy, and the telephone. Robida nonetheless trivializes Edison's futuristic intermedial contraption. Indeed, a clear sign of Robida's comic dexterity is his ability to lionize and belittle Edison's resourcefulness simultaneously, all the while keeping the laughs flowing, all that know-how, the jest starring two American females assures us is marshaled merely to perform a housekeeping task, keeping irksome, uh, adulterous American in line. Its hilarity and originality drink deeply from the wellspring of Parisian stereotypes about American men, credulous cuckolds. Women, poh, morally lax, Vassandire, and the upstart inventor himself, a wily genius solving a trivial problem. The taxonomization process referenced by Mike Good is in vigorous operation. Female viewers may admire the agency of the Americans in this program on the brink of outfoxing authoritarian spouses, but they're not allowed the pleasure of uh, positive identification and recognition because the mobile women are imagined to be under the control of an electric behavior tracker. Looked at by uh, women similarly constrained, the scenario may foster the humor of painful recognition, which is an inherently conservative social form, alas, according to Laura Kipnis. If cathartic laughter follows, quote, the laughter depends on our recognizing the world as it is and leaving it the way we found it. Like all cathartic laughter, it questions nothing, uh, end quote. Now, um, to go back into the world of um, French modernist representation of uh, uh, urban prostitution, um, I, I want some of my, you know, my new kind of, I'm going to say sort of recognition of, maybe even, I'm not quite admiration for, but recognition of the complexities of caricature to somehow be brought to bear on um, looking again in a fabulous uh, picture like this, Degas' Women in Front of a Cafe, Pastel over Monotype from 1877. I mean, I still think that um, Carol Armstrong's phrase is entirely apt. She wrote, Degas uses a language of bodily impropriety and gestural innuendo, quote, end quote. Of course, that's right. I, too, stress the importance of the central woman's gesture, this famous uh, thumb in the mouth here. I called it a multi-layered elusive device. I argued that it secured the vulgarity of the street prostitute, combining um, uh, 
a complaint perhaps about um, an inadequate payment with a kind of uh, unmistakable uh, right there at the cafe table in the street form of raccourcage, a kind of um, promise of a certain uh, form of sexual um, service that would be on tap should she be engaged. So I, I argue that this securing of her identity resulted in, this is the, the words I used at the time, a reversal of the progressive values often assigned to modernist ambiguity. Um, that's, that's, that, that would be marked with an asterisk to sort of think again about whether that's the right way to actually um, characterize this combination of moves. Um, yes, I believe it does instate a contradictory dialectic of disgust and fascination. But now I think I would stress um, the caricatural certitude of that gesture that sits right at the center of effectively a rather different kind of picture. Um, it sits right in the middle of an otherwise virtuosic demonstration of an aesthetically canny use of pastel that moves strongly in the direction of abstraction as well as diluted evasive description. So I think I might, if I were called upon today, oh yes, I am called upon today, um, I might see it as sort of Rather than being the sort of keystone of the picture, I might see it as being a rupture in a, in a picture um, that, that otherwise is uh, moving in other directions. Here's a, um, here's a combination of four closely affiliated um, uh, graphic works. Uh, the, the great 1877 picture I just showed, the cafe woman we looked at already, and then two related uh, monotypes a monotype at the top and its ghost or cognate um, directly below it. You can see it um, establishes a scenario that's very much a sister scenario to the one that was elaborated with pastel in the upper right, um, but it was not elaborated. Um, one can never guess about things that didn't happen, but uh, uh, Right, there, for example, what appeared to be a technical failure that was not a technical failure. But anyway, um, uh, but in any way, it allows us to really hone in on the degree to which the signature paradox of Dugas' most complex work is the coexistence of legible scurrilous gesture with um, broad abstracted uh, handling. This Degas introduces the topic, which I'm only going to uh, review um, quickly, of what I call the um, uh, suspicious professions, namely an iconography of female workers in very particular trades um, that were widely invested with a set of beliefs at the time um, uh, reckoned to be um, a sort of cover for the practice of clandestine prostitution. Workers in the atelier of couture were represented in high numbers, actually, in the sociological data, both within registered and clandestine prostitution. The question is, do the pictures of the avant-garde of, uh, of workers in the suspicious profession shore up the belief that working class female sexuality was unstable? Um, I just want to point out in um, this uh, uh, Pastel by Degas of milliners. Um, it's in the, the Nelson Atkins Museum in uh, Kansas City in the States. One of the things that is striking, uh, I mean, there are many things that are striking, but one is certainly this uh, human tarantula up here on top of this hat, this extraordinarily um, <laughs> intrusive, somewhat sinister um, uh, claw-like hand that sits on top of the straw hat that very much um, seems to instate something sinister, nasty, untoward in the power dynamic between the two women in the picture. Again, we can see Dugas working with um, a very a rupturing gesture surrounding which um, pictorial means are deployed um, otherwise. You can see it again In this, uh, another uh, one of these amazing pastels um, that is set within the framework of the practice of the military, uh, not the military trade, that would be the millinery trade. And again, I call your attention to the splayed fingers um, of this exceptional um, hand. 
So again, a sort of hypertense, intrusive, rupturing hand that imports tension and even narrative into an otherwise aestheticized and abstracted terrain. Now this, I have to throw this in, but I don't have anything exceptionally clever to say about it, but it's, I think it's important for us to keep it in mind. This is this uh, wonderful pastel um, from the Art Institute of Chicago of a milliner, also from about the same date, the mid-70s. Uh, it's another circa 1877. Um, and in this case, um, it, it's, it's fair to say that it does not carry within its own means some kind of implication of um, sexual intemperance or um, venality. It seems to be an entirely neutral uh, portrayal. Nonetheless, the choice speaks volumes, the choice of the millinery worker as a subject of modernity. So this, um, the, the question that would be raised here, and it's a sort of take home homework question, um, look, does the gender identity of the artist make a difference? And if it makes a difference, is it that simple? Can various representational strategies and ideological maneuvers be mapped onto gender identity? We've been asking that question for many years together, and I think we have to keep asking it. Um, but I hope we'll all agree that it's not, it's not very simple. And then finally, um, I wanted to show you, this is sort of my, my closeout apropos of uh, modernist representations. I wanted to show you these three exceptional I'll bet I'll find them hanging upstairs. Um, these exceptional works by Monet, all of them date circa 1878. Um, and in all three of them, he was working with uh, loaded material, again, a subject from out in culture that was already completely freighted um, with uh, connotations of dubious, venal, commercialized female sexuality. He's working in all, all cases with the, um, the brasserie à femme, a relatively new kind of um, commercialized entertainment. By 1879, there were 130 of them, and then by 1888, there were 200 of them. They were, uh, it was a, a growing proposition. In um, all three, especially, especially uh, this one, um, the woman is uh, the woman in question, the brasserie uh, server, is shown standing and working, and um, the array of the ingredients, both in terms of the, the, the architecture, the, the actual labor being performed, the diversity of the clientele, and so forth, um, they all work against and indeed to some degree defy the standard iconography of the Brasserie Fama. And in this case, um, we have to, I think we have to call that face um, equivocal, uh, deadpan, and open to multiple uh, readings. So a complex series like this really sends us crashing into the hardest part of the assignment. Oy, what a long paragraph. Um, but um, it, it leads us um, to really have to work hard to decide whether or not that old point of mine really stands. Is ellipsis in representation a strategy of containment? Um, Ambiguity constituted then a male sexual politics, indeterminacy and open-endedness worked for the painters as ways to master and contain certain male anxieties about women who were found ungovernable, especially sexually open, lower class women. Oh, this is good because it has a misspelled word. That's a nice feature. Though uh, the use of ellipsis in pictures was a means to limit the threat of female sexual force. You can uh, read the rest of that uh, yourself. So um, I think, anyway, I don't, I don't know that I'm, I'm prepared to completely turn the proposition upside down because I think the whole question of um, this whole, you might say this whole uh, corpus of representations, um, very much like the Robida uh, front page that I, um, uh, I explicated, I mean, is a set of operations that, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not shrill or inappropriate to talk about the operations of visual imagery within patriarchy. I mean, that is what we're talking about, and it still remains the case. But whether or not it is a, a, a technology of, of, of containment is something that is uh, worth thinking more about. So I want to, this is really going to be the end. I want to end sort of 
Yeah, today, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in promoting paradox. Well, how's this for a paradox? I'm going to end with a sort of contradictory, valedictory salute to the pictures of a completely different kind, to the pictures, the, the hyper-depictive certainty of two works that describe and unleash the venal sexuality of their protagonists without compromise, without ambiguity. And I'm doing this in order for you, all of you out there, to, uh, to think, to gauge what's gained and what's lost in um, the gulf between these last two pictures I'm going to show you and what I've been talking about. Um, this is, of course, the work Splendeur um, by Ernest Ange uh, uh, Duez. It was shown in 1874 as half of a triptych. This seems to me the eponymous, in many ways, Balzac and this, the two eponyms of the present exhibition, Splendeur and misère. There's no doubt um, in terms of the clothing, the time of day, the lighting, the individual detail that uh, Duez is giving us, as it were, the facts of contemporary street prostitution. And of course, the explicit painting uh, par excellence, Gervex's Rolla. Um, let me say that despite the fact that this painting has become so well known and has been added to the collections of the Musée d'Orsay, I thought that I discovered it. I thought, I, you know, I invented prostitution, and I thought that I discovered this painting, you know, the delusions of youth. Um, I thought this was my exclusive art historical trouvaille. I made a special trip, how heroic of me, all the way to Bordeaux um, to look at it when I was a graduate student. A Paris dealer had tipped me off that there was something lurking there that would, would be worth my while. Um, when I discussed it in that old book of mine, I approached it within the topic of fashion as threat. Um, and indeed, the explicit eroticism of the painting's details still astound me. Gervex's inclusion of a range but small, but apparently irresistible indecencies requires a revisitation. The 26-year-old Gervex engineered a hypersexualized scenario, right, in which the slumbering girl Marion is completely hemmed in by the phallus. At left, it's, well, it's funny, isn't it? At, at left, the drooping male, uh, sorry, the drooping blue comforter, which issues forth from the dashing Jacques Rolla's trousers, <laughs> enables his detumescent post-coital condition to be displaced to and summoned up very well by bedclothes. And at right, look at that, and at right, the erect cane pokes through an opening in Marion's red department store um, corset, reminding us of the phallic alertness that heralded their coupling. The pile of clothes on the right, in fact, instates the temporality of the clothing removal that accompanied their lovemaking. No mistake that she was out of her corset before he took off his hat. <laughs> so. So here's, I guess this is the final question. Does such a picture constitute a release or make you want to run as fast as you can back into the safe haven of modernist evasion and deadpan? Okay. The end, thank you very much.